It's going to be one of those mornings. You know what? Let's just, let's just pray let's, before I say anything else. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God beside you who acts for those who wait for him. And Lord, there are many people gathered today in your name who are confused about the things that are happening in our country, in our lives, in our society, who are angered about the things that are happening, who are afraid because of the things that are happening. And we've all gathered in your name, Lord, to actively wait on you so that you will act on our behalf. It's so counterintuitive. We have such a shoot first, aim later mentality. And yet you call us through your word to wait on you and so that you might act. And so we're here gathered waiting, Lord, for you to act waiting for you to bring this country to repentance, waiting for you to put an end to the violence, waiting for you to put an end to racism, waiting for you to put an end to oppression, waiting for you to put an end to the taking of innocent life from abortions to people pulled over by police officers to police officers, act, waiting for you to act to right all the wrongs, to bring justice for those who are oppressed. We're waiting for you, God, to do only what you can do. And of all the things that we could say, all the encouraging words that we could say, there's nothing more encouraging or relevant to our situation today than the gospel. The message of what Christ did through His flesh to put an end to racism, to put an end to heartache and sorrow and pain and anguish and injustice and separation and your wrath. So God, make us a people that love the gospel. Make us a people who put our hope in the gospel Make us a people who understand the hope of the gospel, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Take this feeble message, Lord, and use it to give us zeal for the gospel. And help me. Be supremely kind to me today, God. For you know my desperate state, and you know all too well the amount of help I need. So show up today, God, and glorify your name through your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The reason that we're zealous for the gospel at the way, and the reason I want you to be a people that are zealous for the gospel, is because the, the moment, the very moment that we outgrow the gospel, we outgrow God, who manifests himself in the gospel and acts on our behalf through the gospel. Because as I just prayed, for from of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God who acts for those who wait for him. And what we're going to see today in Colossians 1, 1 through 14 is one little verse that shows us the absolute necessity of the gospel. Because according to Paul, God not only acts mightily on our behalf, as we wait for Him through the gospel, He empowers our waiting for Him by the gospel, thus ensuring His acting on our behalf. So the gospel is how God acts for us because we wait for Him. 
And the gospel is how God causes us to wait for him, which brings about his acting. So when you cast aside the gospel, you cast aside how God acts for you because we wait for him and what God uses to make us wait for him, which is why he acts on our behalf in the first place. God acts on our behalf through the gospel because through the gospel, God empowers us with his power to wait for him to act. And so what, that, what this means is this. There's never a moment in your Christian life that you outgrow the simple message of the gospel, that Christ came and lived a perfect life, a life that God requires us to live, that we have no shot at living, and by faith in that perfect life, you get that life and you get those works and you get that righteousness and you get his beauty and you get his glory and you get his majesty and you get his kingdom and you get his fullness living in you right now. And as you persevere and wait because of Christ in you now, you are ensuring yourself of your own soul that yes, Christ is in me, but you're actually waiting with a view to the future of when you're going to get fully what you get in part right now. That's, that's how it works. If you want God to act mightily in your life, you need the gospel. He doesn't act apart from it. And in case this seems elementary or irrelevant to you, which it might, consider this. If a church that was started so closely to the death of resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ by people who were eyewitnesses to the person of Jesus Christ can easily abandon Christ in favor for Colossians 2 verse 4, plausible arguments, Colossians 2 verse 8, or philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ, or Colossians 2 verse 23, for regulations that have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. If a church so closely connected to Christ historically can abandon Him for all these things, can't we? And haven't we? I mean, this is our problem. This is the problem at The Way and at every other church out there. Is we've taken Christ, who's supposed to be preeminent, who's supposed to be central, who's supposed to be the head, and we've made, we've made him the tail. We've made Christ the tail of our ministries, the tail of our outreach programs, the tail of our callings, the tail of our own personal desires. We do 10,000 things in the name of Christ and call them callings and ministries and outreach and vocations and exercising of gifts. And they all look very religious. Look at all these religious people doing religious things in the name of Christ, but for themselves. And we abandon Christ in us. His glory being our glory. His life being our life. His righteousness being our righteousness. His perfection being our perfection. His beauty being our beauty. His majesty being our majesty. His kingdom being our kingdom. His rule being our reign. We, could, we, we toss those to the side. And we forget that the upward call of God is not ministry, nor is it marriage, but Christ Himself. And so we set off on a spiritual journey making much of serving of Christ, but mostly serving ourselves, forging our identity in what we do for Christ rather than finding our identity in what Christ has done for us, taking our desires and calling them the will of God rather than allowing the will of God to shape our desires, using godliness as a means of gain and in gaining everything, having nothing. We don't have a thing. All because we've got the Christian life backwards. Growing in Christ, fulfilling God's calling for us is accomplished by meditating on what it means for you, for, for you to dwell in God through Christ and for God to dwell in you through Christ. This reality is the only thing that will keep us from trading hell's lump of, or heaven's diamond for hell's lump of coal. This reality is the only thing that will keep you from trading your ministry, 
Christ for ministry or Christ for marriage or Christ for a calling. If we lose sight of this simple reality, Christ lives in me now, I'll have him forever. We will prostitute the word for selfish gain. We'll prostitute callings. We'll prostitute signs. We'll prostitute whatever looks religious for the sake of self. And that's why Paul writes. And it's why I'm preaching. We need the gospel. From beginning to end, when you read the book of Colossians, from beginning to end of chapter 1, a man-made chapter division, if all you read of Colossians was chapter 1, one thing should be painstakingly clear, and it's this. God is not passive. He's active. And we spent all week talking about that simple fact. God is a God who acts. You see it in verses 3 and 4, right? When Paul writes, We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. We thank God since we heard of your faith in Christ and of your love for all the saints. I thank God for Brad Thompson's love because it's God who's working love in Brad Thompson. That's the point. I thank God that you're doing so well because without God, you're just like everybody else. God's acting in you. And that's why I thank Him. Now look at how he's acting in verses 3 through 6. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ and of the love that you have for all the saints. Why do they have this faith and love? Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Okay, so faith in Christ and love for the saints comes from a heavenly hope. A hope that's in heaven. That makes sense, right? So when I look at this hope in heaven... One of the things that meditating on this hope in heaven does is it produces faith in Christ and love for the saints. But how do I know about this hope? Well, that's what we're told next. Of this, this hope, you have heard before in the word of the truth. What's that? The gospel. Oh, okay. Which has come to you. As indeed in the whole world, it, the gospel, is bearing fruit and increasing as it also is bearing fruit and increasing among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. So God bears the fruits of faith and love in our lives through the gospel. This gospel that says Christ in you is the hope of glory. That is what bears fruit for us. And we're going to talk about that next week. All next week is we're going to talk about how the gospel causes us to bear fruit. So God acts at the beginning of this gospel in the life of the Colossians, and it doesn't take you very long to figure out that He's acting in their lives, bearing the fruit of faith and love through the gospel. God acts through the gospel. But not only is God acting and bearing fruit in the lives of the Colossians through the gospel, He's active in the people preaching of the gospel, preaching the gospel, so that in their preaching of the gospel and they're explaining the gospel, more fruit will come through a deeper understanding of the gospel. So God's at work in the people that hear the gospel to bear fruit, and He's at work through the gospel in the people preaching the gospel, so that as they preach the gospel and people understand it more deeply, more fruit is born. And the reason I say this is because of what Paul writes in chapter 1, verse 29. For this maturity in Christ, I toil, struggling, so Paul is working here, isn't he? Toiling, struggling, this is what I'm doing. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm toiling with it. I'm struggling with it. I'm wielding it. It's my weapon. I'm just wielding and struggling and toiling. I want you to understand it. But he's doing it with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. So in one sense, Paul's working, isn't he? Toiling, struggling, but in another sense, behind all of Paul's toiling and, and, and struggling is the energy of God. But this energy of God's not sitting there. It's not like a one of those camelback things, you know, you put on your back and, and, and you can put it in your mouth and just drink water. So if, if I need energy, what I do is I'm just gonna put on this, if I need water, I'm just gonna put on this backpack and just well, every time I suck, I'm gonna get water. That, that's not the way Paul's being energized with the power of God. It's not sitting there like a backpack full of water, and every time Paul needs energy, he goes, and he gets it. 
That's not the way it's described. Here's the way it's described. It's described as God exerting his energy as he powerfully works through Paul. That's what's going on. In Paul's working and doing, God's energy is being exerted. Period. Now, what this means is God is not only bearing fruit for the Colossians through the gospel that Paul preaches. It's Paul's understanding of the gospel bearing fruit in Christ Jesus that God uses to work more fruit for the Colossians in the unfolding of the mystery of the gospel that Paul preaches. So the gospel is causing them to bear fruit, but God's also working through the preaching of the gospel and the preacher's understanding of the gospel to bring about the fruit. So at the beginning to the end, what you have in fruit bearing is gospel. Whether or not it's heard or preached, God's in it. God's working in it through your hearing and understanding and bearing fruit. And He's working through me as I'm toiling and struggling with all of God's energy to help us get it so we can bear more fruit. So you never outgrow the gospel, ever. It's what I need to be able to help better, you better understand it so that you can bear more fruit, and it's what I need to understand so that I can bear more fruit. We're all indebted to the gospel. And when you get to Colossians 1, 9 through 14, Paul doesn't abandon the activity of God on behalf of the Colossians. Instead, he continues asking God to do what God has already done. Look at Colossians 1, 9 and 10. And so, from the day we heard, we've not ceased to pray for you. Asking God that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Here's the purpose. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So don't miss this just really simple fact. God, Paul asked God to do something for the Colossians for the purpose of of empowering them to walk in a way that's pleasing to God. Paul says, God, will you help them to walk in a way that's pleasing to you by understanding your gospel? It's such an elementary concept, right? But it's really, really profound. Because what do you do when five policemen are, are sniped by a sniper hiding in a building? Well, I mean, what do you do? What do you do when somebody's shot at a traffic stop? I mean, what do you pray? What do you pray to change the trajectory of life? What do you pray to change the trajectory of hate? Well, according to this text, you pray, God, will you cause your gospel to run and to spread and to bear fruit and to increase and to get so inside the people who are driven by hate that they will see through the gospel love, love divine, pure, free, no strings attached, on a cross, God embodied in the flesh, the clearest, most definitive revelation of who God is in the person of Jesus, dying for the sniper, dying for the cops, dying for the people pulled over at the traffic stop, helping them to see and understand what it means to have a perfect life imputed to them by faith and in understanding all that you are for us in Jesus Christ, bear the fruit of love instead of hate. That's, that is what we pray as Christians. The solution to these problems is not politics. It's sure in Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. It's the gospel. But the problem that we have as Christians is we don't believe it. We would much rather lobby for gun control or say guns don't kill people, people kill people, than, than go to the gospel and say, God, help these people understand it. Help me understand it more so that I can live it and I can tell it and I can show it and help them understand it more. So they're not afraid of people because of the color of their skin and so that people of the opposite skin color don't associate murdering of black people to be some kind of racial flaw in white people. Behavior. Behavior is not a skin color issue. We're not inherently bad because we're black. And we're not inherently bad because we're white. We're inherently bad because we're sinners. Period. 
We all have that genetic gene passed down from our daddy, Adam. And it doesn't, we have to, the gospel is the only thing that helps us clear that hurdle. Because if you don't, you're stuck thinking that way. You're stuck thinking that crime is a black problem. Affluency, stock market crashes is a white problem. Terrorists is a Middle Eastern problem. And they're all global gospel problems fixed by the gospel, caused by a misunderstanding of the gospel. So we have to ask God for help to walk in a way that He wants us to walk. No law will make you do it. No amount of asceticism will help you do it. It's God help. Help this church to walk in a way that's pleasing to you. Help us to understand what it means to be connected to Christ on such a level that we love the way you love and serve the way you serve and, and all those things. Now this is, a, this is an aside, but there, there's one more thing I want you to see about this. What I described to you is a natural inclination that we have in the church. Namely, if somebody's not doing right, they go to the top of our prayer list. You know? Pray for the terrorists. Pray for those who practice homosexuality. Pray for those who don't go to a certain church or don't come to our church. Pray for those who are sick. What prompts Paul's prayer for these people? And so... From the day we heard. Heard of what? Well, from the day they heard of their faith in Christ and of their love for all the saints, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking God that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Paul prays for those who are doing well precisely because they're doing well. I heard you're doing great. And so I haven't stopped praying for you. This is the opposite of how we think, right? Spiritual giants are nowhere near the top of our prayer list. I mean, it's, that's reserved for the people that really need the help. <laughs> and we're inclined to say that our struggle with sin necessitates fervent prayer, and it does. But Paul would say your victory over sins, sin necessitates fervent prayer just as much. <laughs> this means at the very least, every one of us needs prayer. If I were to say, all right, I'm opening up the floor. What are your prayer requests? Some of you probably say, well, man, you know what? I've been doing good this week. Walking with the Lord, victory, purity of eyes, heart. You know, I'm doing great. I don't, I don't, need, I don't need anything. And Paul would say, you absolutely need something. I'm so glad you're doing great. I'm going to pray for you so that you'll continue to do great. And suddenly our prayer list widens, doesn't it? We're not only praying for those out there that really need it. Suddenly we begin to understand that, oh my goodness, everybody needs it. Everybody needs it. And this is just food for thought, but could it be that one of the reasons that we walk so poorly in Christ is because we don't pray for one another while we're walking in a way that pleases Christ. I mean, how much trouble could we save one another on the back end of a displeasing walk if we prayed for one another on the front end of a pleasing one? How few people would slip into habitual sins if we said, oh, they look like they're doing great. I'm going to pray for them. We're so reactionary in our prayer life. It's like, just like we live life. Oh, there's a fire. We better put it out. You know, we, like, we, we wait till the fire of lust burns within us so before we ask for any help when in all actuality, the way we keep the fire from lust burning, from burning inside of us is that you have a whole church of people dumping water on a set of logs that are soaked. That... Any normal person say, there's no way a fire can be started from this set of soaked, watered-down logs. And we say, oh, <laughs> oh, yes, there is. There's been plenty of flame. 
of sin come from water-soaked logs. And we, one after another, taking up the arms of prayer, are dumping water on something that seems like it has no chance of catching fire. That's what Paul means when he says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it. There have been many campgrounds who've been burned to the ground because people have walked away from a fire that looked like it was extinguished and wet and it got out of control. Food for thought. That's an aside. Verses 12 through 14, Paul shifts from asking God to do something into reminding us what God has already done and what we have because of it, right? Oh, I'm actually, yeah, let's just stay, we'll stay here and I'll go back to verse 11. Giving thanks to the Father who's qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of His Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So there are the three things He's done. He's qualified us to share in the inheritance in the past, delivered us in the past from the domain of darkness, and transferred us in the past to the kingdom of His beloved Son. And because of those actions in the past, you have something amazing in the present, namely forgiveness of sins. God's acting. God's acted in the past on behalf of these people. It's, it's bearing fruit in their current action. And, and it's... Because they're forgiven, because of what God's done in the past, Paul has no problem going to the throne saying, on the basis of the blood of Christ, would you please help them to continue to walk in a way that's pleasing to you? And lastly, in verse 11, this is the last evidence that God's still acting here. He says, May you be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. This is amazing. We're going to really get down and dirty with this next week. So I'll just kind of wet your palate for it today. God not only equips us with the knowledge that we need to walk in a way that pleases Him, but part of walking in a way that pleases Him is to walk in such a dependence on His power that our walking with Him looks like waiting for Him. Or to say it differently, God is so active in your walk with Him that in comparison to God's activity in your Christian walk, it looks like you're just waiting. It looks like you're waiting. <laughs> and that's really encouraging. Because one of the things that we don't think about as Christians is that we have to be strengthened for endurance and waiting on the Lord. So we, we, we would think that what we need for endurance is patience, is knowledge of His will, and what Paul says, no, really what you need to be, to be patient and to endure is not knowledge of what God's working in your life right now, but the strength that belongs to the Lord to give you endurance to wait for Him. God will only outrun you, this is a hypothetical, if you don't have the endurance to wait. We might say, God will outrun me if I can't keep up with Him. And the Bible says, God will outrun you if you can't wait for Him. If you don't have the endurance to wait, He's gone. So, we'll talk about that next week. And so here's what we have. We have, when you put it all together, God asking, Paul asking God to do something for the Colossians of the future because of the forgiveness they have in the present, because of what God did for them in the past. That's the way it works. We approach the throne of God in the present, forgiven, because of what God did for us in the past. And the faithfulness of God in the past and the present moves us to ask for His faithfulness in the future. That's how faith works. Past provision, met. Present provision, met. Future provision, He'll do it again. And that's where we go. The greatest reality in the world is being forgiven by God, not Merely so you can be forgiven, so that Christ can live in you because you're forgiven. That is the hope of the gospel. So, God acts. We got that down. The question becomes now, how does He act? And the answer is, I've already answered it, He acts on our behalf through belief in the gospel. The more that we meditate on, behold, and believe in all that God is for us in the person of Jesus Christ through the gospel, the more of Christ we receive through the Holy Spirit as we believe in the gospel. Galatians 3 and verse 2. Did you... 
receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Well, by hearing with faith. That's how you receive the Holy Spirit. If you need more of the Spirit in your life right now, what God is calling you to do is to go to the gospel and believe it. Believe it more and receive more. That's how it works. The more you believe the promises of God in the gospel, the hope of glory, which is Christ in you in the gospel, the more of Christ you receive through the Spirit as you believe. That's how you get it. Now, it's easy to miss the simplicity of this. You're like, some of you are like, simplicity of this? And overcomplicate things. And some of you are like, that's what you've been doing this entire sermon. <laughs> if you divorce verse 9 and 10 from the context, because when you read verses 9 and 10, there's going to be something that, that rises up in every one of us, right? And I call it discerning the will of God. Let's read it. And so, from the day we heard, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. So how are you going to walk in a manner that pleases the Lord? Paul's asking God to help you do it, but he asked God to do something for you so you can do it. What does he ask Him to do for us? Well, he says, Will you fill them with the knowledge of your will? in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So in order for me to walk in a manner that's pleasing to the Lord, all I got to know is God's will and all spiritual wisdom and insight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set about trying to figure out God's will for my life. And when I figure out God's will for my life, and I make the right decision based on God's will for me, well, then I know I'm walking in a way that pleases for Him because I know I'm in His will. And so, you know what you do when you start doing that? You start looking at every situation you're in and saying, all right, God, what is your will for me in this situation? What is your will for me when I'm purchasing a car? What is your will for me when I'm looking for a wife? Should I marry this person or should I not marry this person? Should I take this job or should I not take this job? Should I go to seminary or should I not go to seminary? Should I pursue a calling? Should I pursue a gift? What should I do? What do I need to do? What's your will? I want to make the right decision because when I know you will to make the right decision, then you love me and I'm right with you. And that's the way we think. We think, okay, well, yeah, if I just know the will of God, I'll be good. And when you go about discerning the will of God that way, you do precisely what Paul writes this letter to warn people not to do. That's what they do. They, they, they miss the simplicity of what it means to what God's will for them is. And they start chasing it in what foods they eat and what foods they don't eat. In what days they celebrate and in what days they don't celebrate in philosophy and arguments and, and calls and asceticism and severity to the body. Oh, it makes it, I'm look religious here. And Paul said, oh, you just, the problem is, is you've, take, you've taken the will of God for your life and so divorced it from Christ in you that you've made Christ the tail of your ministry instead of the head. And what I mean by that is this. If God gives a rip about us being in a certain ministry, it's because that certain ministry will give us more of Jesus than we would have otherwise had. Period. Which means what? Ministry's not your calling. Christ is. That's what it means. Marriage is not your calling. Christ is. A spiritual gift is not your calling. Christ is. God gives us all of these things to enjoy, to walk in, and to grow in so that we can have more of Christ. But when we substitute the ministry, which is the means for the end, which is Christ, we're no longer serving Christ in our ministry. We're serving ourselves in the name of Christ. And we miss it. We miss the point. When, and I want to show you this. Well, when Paul speaks of us being filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, he refers to us going deeper into who and what God is for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Not our ministry and not our marriage and not our cars and not our jobs. Primarily. Can he use those things? 
to make us more Christ-like? Absolutely. But that's not what he's talking about here. And if you live your life trying to make decisions like that, you'll be utterly disappointed. Because when you seek God's will in that way, the very way that you're seeking it is opposite of God's will for you. So even in the seeking of God's will in that way, you're already off. You're already off. It refers to the gospel, knowing what it means for Christ to be in us. And I know this for two reasons. Here's the first. The first is the correlation that exists between verses 9 through 12 in chapter 1 and verses 1 through 27 through 2 through 8. All right. So in verses 9 through 12, Paul speaks of us being filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So as we read, as I'm reading to you, chapter 1, verse 27 through chapter 2, verse 5, listen for the knowledge of God's will, spiritual wisdom and understanding and how Paul uses them in chapter 2. Ready? To them... God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I can't wait till we get there. I've really preached four sermons on it, but I'm going to preach another one when we get there. The hope of glory. Look at verse 28. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Paul's goal and helping these people discern God's will is helping them understand what it means to have Christ in them and for them to be in Christ and to have in Christ all the riches, all the knowledge of all the, all the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are in Christ Jesus. Christ is the content of what Paul proclaims. He proclaims it in wisdom for the purpose that people might be mature in Christ. That's where the maturity comes from. Not from knowing God's will so you can make the right decision on your spouse. It's knowing God's will for you in Christ and looking at marriage through the lens of Christ and not on whether or not you should get married or whether or not you should marry that particular person. But he continues to go. For this I toil, struggling with all God's energy that he powerfully works within me. So, think about this. Paul's struggling, proclaiming Christ to bring about an awareness of Christ's likeness, right? But it's not really Paul the one that's doing it. It's God doing it through Paul. And if God is struggling through Paul to bring about a knowledge of what it means for Christ to be in them, what do you think is important to God? Whether or not you go to seminary or whether or not you understand this reality. It's this reality that's important to God. It's so important to God that God's working in it to do it. Paul can't foul this up. He needs help. I'll do it in him, with him, for him. That's how important this is. Now, Colossians 2 verse 1. For I want you to know how great a struggle. Here's that, that language. Paul's wrestling, right? I have for you and for those at Laodicea, for all who've not seen me face to face. And this is what he's struggling for. Verse 2. That their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, I pray that God would fill you with, with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. I'm struggling so that you may reach the riches of the full assurance of understanding of the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's what we're being strengthened to understand. Christ. God's will for us. Christ likeness. God's will for us. And it's in knowing Christ that you are exposed to the wisdom and the knowledge of God's will. Christ is the content of Paul's proclamation. And it is in Christ that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden, which means that Christ is the one to whom we must go to seek God's will in our life. And when we do it any other way, we're actually going against what Paul says in this verse. 
To go about seeking God's will as if it's separate and apart from Christ in you is to be just like the people that he's writing to. That's the point. This is, the, this is why he's writing. Don't do it this way. But not only is there a correlation between the words knowledge, spiritual wisdom, understanding. Here's another one. There's a correlation between knowing Christ and walking in Christ. This is 1 verse 10. Paul writes that being filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding is for the what? purpose of walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. Now, think about this in read Colossians 2 verses 6 through 7. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving, which is a reference to chapter 1, verse 12, giving thanks to the Father. So all this is to show you that these verses, what the understanding of God's will and spiritual wisdom, they're not divorced from the context of the entire letter. In chapter 2, Paul speaks explicitly as to what this is, and it is the hope of the gospel, Christ in us. Us believing the gospel, seeing the glory of God in the person of Christ through the gospel as our highest treasure, our greatest good, has the effect of us walking in Christ. But some of you may say this, well, okay, I concede that. I can see how understanding Christ is what God's will for me is in every situation for me to be more Christ-like and not for me to make a particular decision. But it doesn't say anything at all about the gospel. In verses 9 through 14. And you've been telling me the entire sermon that God moves through the gospel. How is it part of the gospel? Well, look at the two participles that describe what walking in a manner worthy of the Lord looks like in verse 10. It says he wants us to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So be in, to be filled with the knowledge of God's wisdom and all spiritual, or the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and insight, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord fully pleasing to Him. What does it look like? Well, it looks like bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Well, how do we do that? How do we bear fruit and increase in the knowledge of God? Well, look at what Paul uses to describe the activity of the gospel in verse 6 of chapter 1. The gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world, is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you. That is the key. The key to us walking in a manner worthy of the Lord, and which is bearing fruit and increasing, is to be attached and tethered to the message that actually bears fruit and increases in us, namely the gospel. The gospel is what bears fruit and increases. And if you want to be a person that bears fruit and increases, you must understand what? The gospel which contains this hope of glory, Christ in you. God's work in our lives is never separated from the gospel. Every security, every peace that passes every understanding, every comfort and every affliction, every single ray of hope that comes to us from God comes through the gospel. And if you live your life swimming in the, in the ocean of God's glory in His gospel, you'll find that you'll never get to the bottom of it. And the deeper that you go in the gospel, the more of Christ you have, the more peace that you have, the more joy you have, the more love that you bear, the more faith is produced. So let's go back to where we first started. Here's what I said. It's what this whole sermon revolves around. There's one verse in here that I think demonstrates our desperate need for the gospel. God acts for those who wait for Him through the gospel. And it is through the gospel that we are strengthened to wait. Which means, if you want God to act for you, you must wait for Him. And if you're going to have the endurance to wait for Him, you have to have the gospel. It's what causes your waiting, and your waiting is what calls down God's doing. And this is where I see it. Colossians 1 verse 11. May you be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience. 
So God fills us with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual understanding by showing us Christ in the gospel. Slain for sinners. Raised for our justification. Ruling in heaven. Lived for us. Died for us. Rose for us. Ascended for us. Reigns for us. Will come again for us. So that we might walk in a manner worthy of Him in the power of the gospel. So that as we walk with Christ, we might be strengthened with all His power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience. So that as we wait in our Christian walk, God might further sustain that walk through constantly empowering us to wait as we walk. Because that's what walking is. It's waiting. Walking in Christ is waiting for Christ. It's resting in Christ. It is with all of your endurance waiting for the hope of glory. It's stiff arming the lust of the flesh as it says in Colossians 3 verse 1 and it's setting your mind on the things that are, or that are above for we are, have died and our life is hidden with God in Christ and when Christ who is our life appears we will also appear with Him in glory. That's what the Christian life is made of. It's made of walking with Christ and that walking is waiting for Christ. Waiting for a further consummation of the glory we have right now. The peace that passes understanding that you have right now, you'll have infinitely more of eternally in Christ Jesus. The beauty of Christ that's in your life right now, you'll have infinitely more of eternally in Jesus Christ. The power which you're strengthened in Christ right now, you'll have infinitely more of eternally through the person of Jesus Christ. You'll have His reign, His power, His rule, His glory, His beauty, His life, His death, His righteousness, His kingdom forever, co-reigning with Him. That's what you have. And it's understanding the gospel that gives us the hope to persevere the mess of this life so that we can have something better on the other side. That's God's will for you. That's why you're created. You're not created for a ministry. You're not created for seminary. You're not even created for marriage. You're created for Christ. And that's it. Christ in you, the hope of glory, finding your peace, hope, joy, satisfaction, all you need in Him forever and ever. God works for those who wait through the gospel. And it's through the gospel that He causes us to wait, ensuring that He works. It's beautiful. If you're not a believer, the gospel functions the same way. God places His demands for righteousness on an imperfect people incapable of meeting those demands. But through the gospel, He says, I'll meet those demands for you in the person of Jesus Christ. What do you think about that? If you're a Christian, the gospel is good news to you. It's because God demands you to wait and you're incapable of waiting. Don't believe me? Look at your life. It gets too hot, got to turn down the air conditioner. Can't wait for the coolness of night. Can't wait for food. Can't wait for anything. Fix it right now. Fix it right now. We're incapable of waiting. But the gospel says if you want God to work for you, you got to wait for Him. I can't. It's okay. I'll give you the gospel so that you can. I'll give you my power so that you can wait and endure patiently waiting for me. And because I cause you to wait for me in the gospel, I work for you through the gospel. That's good news for the believer. For the unbeliever, it's good news because... God never stops meeting the demands that He places on your life. Ever. He does it when you believe the gospel. He does it as you continue to believe the gospel. And He will meet every one of your needs for all of eternity. Why do you think that it says the Lamb of God will shelter His people in their presence? We will never outgrow our need for God. And the good news of the gospel is from the time you're born again for all of eternity, God will supply you with everything that you need. Everything that you need. And all He says is just come to me. Rest in me. Stop striving for the world. Start, stop striving for your own righteousness. Stop striving for your own justification and receive it from me fully, freely. You can have it by faith. It's yours. Take it. And He takes it. And He does it. And it's glorious. And let's pray. God, we thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the patience of the people here, for them bearing with me. For, I ask for forgiveness for not properly stewarding their time well. 
There's grace there, God. I just pray much good came from today's message. Much hope was stirred. Much glory was given to your gospel, to your word. Help us to believe it. Help us to see it as the cure for everything that ails us. As the means by which you'll change our country, you'll change our church, you'll change our families, and that you'll change us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.